Also from India. Oh. Hi, my name is Mara, and my heritage is from India. Hi, my name is Anika, and my heritage is also from India. Hi, my name is Robert, and my heritage is from China. Hi, my name is Gavin, and my heritage is also from China. Hi, my name is Shreya, and my heritage is from India. Hi, my name is Shinchin, and I, my heritage is from China. Hi, my name is Delilah, and my heritage is from the Philippines. Hi, my name is Claire, and my heritage is from China. Hi, my name is Isha and my heritage is from India. Hi, my name is Florence and my heritage is from China. Hi, my name is Ray and my heritage is from India. Hi, my name is Vivian and my heritage is from China. Hi, my name is Esme and my heritage is from China and Korea. Hi, my name is Alora and my heritage is from India. Hi, my name is Evelyn and my heritage is from China and Singapore. Hi, my name is Soho and my heritage is from India. Hi, my name is Laura and my heritage is from India. Pacific Islander Heritage Month, or AAPI Heritage Month. Quite a mouthful, I know. But what would you expect from a month that celebrates the influence of such a large group? AAPI is the fastest growing demographic in the country, consisting of Americans that can trace their ancestry to 40 Asian countries, over 25,000 separate islands, and 50 ethnic groups with more than 100 languages. So why are these very different cultures grouped together? Simply put, because of the government. Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and Native Hawaiians living in America were grouped together by the census based primarily on the geographical location of their land of origin. The benefits of grouping together multiple cultures with different backgrounds and struggles is, well, debatable. For instance, the families of early Chinese immigrants of the 1800s face entirely different circumstances and struggles than the Southeast Asian immigrants that came to this country as refugees in the 1960s. And both of these cultures' journeys are very different from the Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian experiences of historical colonization. So the term Asian American falls short when trying to encapsulate so many different countries, cultures, struggles, and journeys. That's why the name of the group and the month has evolved and will most likely continue to do so. So if you hear the terms AANHBI, APA, APIBA, or AAPI, or simply Asian American, they're all broadly referring to the larger Asian American, Pacific Island, and Native Hawaiian demographics of America, but not specifically to any one of the many, many cultures within the group. AAPI Heritage Month was first recognized under the Carter administration in 1978 as Pacific slash Asian American Heritage Week. Then in 1990, it was extended and renamed to Asian-Pacific American Heritage Month. Most recently in 2021, it was reaffirmed by President Biden as Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. When celebrating AAPI culture and achievements, acknowledge that it is never safe to assume different cultures can be melded together. Every culture is unique in its own way and everyone deserves to be recognized for their own culture. Not all Pacific Islander dances should be called hula. Not all martial arts are karate. And when you go out and enjoy the newest poke place, understand that it is a Hawaiian dish and not sushi in a bowl. Be aware that not all AAPI people understand the same languages, or that you should greet an Asian American with ni hao or konnichiwa. A perfectly good hello will suffice even if they don't understand English. So what can we do better? Be aware of the generalizations, racial biases, or stereotypes you find yourself falling for, even if those stereotypes might be considered positive. 
The myth of the model minority, and most recently, the crazy rich Asian stereotype, erases differences between individuals and ignores diverse struggles among cultural groups in our population. These stereotypes downplay challenges like discrimination, language barriers, economic inequality, bullying, and more faced by many in our community to this day. Most importantly, understand that AAPI individuals are more than happy to share knowledge about their cultures. Continue to ask questions and be open to learning new concepts and ideas from others. Engage, respect, and enjoy the influence of the AAPI communities of America all year, but especially this May. projected to grow by another 134% over 35 million by 2050. States with the highest AAPI population are California, New York, and Hawaii. The AAPI community in the US is very diverse, with most populations from China, the Philippines, India, Vietnam, the Korean Peninsula, and Japan. This map shows the number of different countries that are represented at Achievement School. The, this data is voluntarily provided by the students in grades 5 to 8 and faculty members. The top subgroups by country of origin or birth are India and China, and we also have students or faculty from the Philippines, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, and Pakistan. But these are only a handful of countries that are a part of Asia. As Sinchi will now share, Asia compromises many more countries, each worth learning more about. Mongolia has its own Olympics. 
Myanmar is called the land of temples and pagodas. Nepal carries eight of the tallest mountains, including Mount Everest. North Korea is the most secretive country in the world. Oman's top selling beverage is Mountain Dew. <laughs> Pakistan has the world's largest deep sea port. Palestinians celebrate Christmas three times a year in Fethullah. The Philippines is home to Asia's first basketball league. Qatar is devoid of forests. Saudi Arabia has the most oil reserves of any nation. In Singapore, the first night zoo was opened. South Koreans are deemed to be a year old when they are born. Sri Lanka is where the oldest tree grown by man stands. And located in Syria, Damascus is the oldest capital city worldwide. Taiwan invented bubble tea. <laughs> Tajikistan has the longest glacier outside the polar regions. Thailand is the largest. Thailand is the largest exporter country of rice. Timor Leste, or East Timor, is home to the Tor de Timor, the world's toughest mountain bike race. Turkey holds more than 80,000 mosques. The UAE, with seven emirates, has the world's highest tower located in one of them, Dubai. While also a double landlocked country, Uzbekistan considers cotton as white gold. In Vietnam, motorbikes with over 60 million are far more common than cars. Final thoughts. In conclusion, Asian appreciation is crucial for building a more inclusive and equitable world. By recognizing and valuing these contrib the contributions, cultures, and experiences of Asians, a greater understanding and respect for diversity can be held. Valuing one's Asian voice is not only the right thing to do, but it is also what makes Asia so incredibly special. And now, Kate will introduce the performance of the Chinese River Dance. Shinshin, Clara, Florence, Vivian, Shrien will perform a ribbon dance. Ribbon dance is also called long silk dance. Long silk dance originated in the Han Dynasty. It is a traditional folk dance of the Han people. The concept of raven colored silk first came from the big sleeves of Han Hanfu, which is a type of traditional Han dress. Through imagination and innovation, the dance continued to develop until it became the ribbon dance we know today. In dynasties after the Han Dynasty in China, the ribbon dance became not only a must-have performance in court activities, but also a performance for foreign guests. Now let's enjoy the ribbon dance. <laughs>
unfortunately, Brian Tao couldn't be here today, so I'm reading the speech that he wrote on his behalf. When I was seven, an older kid on my school bus started pulling their eyes so they became thinner, stretched out like thin lines. He told me that the first pair was Korean, the second pair was Japanese, and the third pair was Chinese. I laughed with him cluelessly. Yet that night, when I brushed my teeth, I took a look into the mirror. I hated my eyes. Three years later, at the height of the pandemic, I sat on the trampoline in my backyard one afternoon. My backyard is surrounded by a white fence. On the right, there is a paved path where people often walk, and behind it, there's a small grove of trees. And as a man walked down the path, he stopped, looked at me, and spat across the fence. From March 2020 to March 2022, there have been over 12,000 reported hate crimes towards AAPIs, ranging from verbal or written hate speech and harassment to violent hate crimes, the murder of an 84-year-old Thai grandpa while he was taking an afternoon walk, the beating of an 18-year-old teen in a subway, and the Atlanta spa shootings, in which six women of Asian descent were killed. So what causes people to commit these actions, whether it be something as small as a racist remark, all the way to causing physical harm? Research has shown that a large part of it is due to a lack of education. Oh, are you going to change the slide for me? Okay, thank you. This summer before my sixth grade year, I watched a PBS docuseries called Asian Americans. This led me to discover an eye-opening part of history and about my own heritage. It also caused me to realize that Asian American history was never taught in my school. And that fact was likely, due for most, was likely true for most schools across America. If Asian American history isn't included in American history, then are we even American? Nearly a decade before the American Revolutionary War, Filipino sailors had already landed in Louisiana, sailing in disease-ridden ships and harsh conditions. They persevered and began cultivating and farming the values of Louisiana. In the 1800s, thousands of Chinese immigrants arrived in the U.S. to participate in the gold rush. Once it ended, they settled in the Bay Area and began building the Transcontinental Railroad through harsh, mountainous conditions and little to no pay. In 1898, Chinese American cook Wong Kim Ark fought for the right to have birth citizenship for all. Wong had been born on U.S. soil, but the Department of Justice tried using the fact that his parents were immigrants against him. His case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and he won. Today, birthright citizenship is given to all children born on U.S. soil. During World War II, despite the internment of over 100,000 Japanese Americans in the U.S., the 442nd Battalion, composed almost entirely of second-generation Japanese Americans, fought valiantly against German troops, even being completely encircled by the enemy and still fighting their way out. Around 18,000 soldiers served in the 442nd Battalion, and approximately 4,000 earned Purple Hearts and 21 earned Medals of Honor. Yet, none of this is taught in school, and most of it is little known. This needs to change. During January of last year, I testified in the Trenton State House in support of a bill that would mandate Asian American history into public school curriculum. The bill was unanimously passed by the Senate Education Committee and later signed into action by Governor Murphy. This movement has begun to catch fire and many states have passed similar legislation. Yet these bills do not affect independent schools and it is up to the students teachers, and administrators of that school to create these important changes. I believe that we can be the ones to create this change here at Chapin. As I think back to some of my earliest encounters with Asian stereotypes, they stand out to me because they've changed me. I still remember the kid on the bus, or the man who spat at me, and I can remember all the times I've been asked, where are you from, or do you eat dogs? Advocacy is like a snowball. Every action, whether it be small or large, makes a difference. Making an effort to learn about someone else's heritage, standing up when you hear stereotypes, these actions all matter. I hope that you'll come out of
of this assembly with a fresh perspective and a fire to create positive change. Thank you. And now to further illustrate how stereotypes and biases against Asians play out in school, Several students will present a series of skits written by Shinshin, Gavin, Rhea, Raj, Narayan, Myra, and Brian. Thank you. 
you have the responses. Mr. Leonard, can you hold one minute while these students come in?
each of us can be proud of our own traditions and heritage and learn about the life and culture of other places. Children's stories can give us a window into other cultures. Folk tales are a special kind of story that is meant for children, but enjoyed by all. Folk tales were usually passed down orally and eventually written down. In most folk tales, good is rewarded and evil is punished. Absurd situations teach a lesson. The story we have to share with you today does just that. This story is called Silly Saburo. Long ago, there was a boy who lived on a farm in Japan. His name was Saburo, but he always did such silly things that people called him Silly Saburo. He could only remember one thing at a time, and then would do that one thing, no matter how silly it was. His mother and father were very worried for him, but they hoped he would get smarter as he grew older and they were always very patient with him. One day, Saburo's father said to him, Saburo, I need your help in the field today. Please go to the potato patch and dig up the potatoes. After you've dug them up, spread them out carefully on the ground and leave them to dry in the sun. I understand, father. Saburo put his shovel over his shoulder and went out to the potato patch. All of a sudden, his shovel hit something buried in the earth. He dug deeper and found a big pot that had been buried there. When he looked inside it, he found many gold coins. Look at all these gold coins. This must be treasure that was buried long ago. But Father says I must dig things up and leave them to dry in the sun. Saburo carefully spread the gold coins on the ground. When he got home, he told his mother and father, I found a pot of gold coins. I spread them out in the sun to dry, just as you said, Father. Saburo's father and mother were very surprised to hear this. They ran back to the potato patch to see. Where are all the coins? Someone must have taken them. Saburo, the next time you find something like this, you must wrap it up very carefully and bring it home. Don't forget. I understand, mother. The next day, Saburo found a smelly cat in the field. He wrapped it up very carefully and brought it home with him. I'm so proud of myself. I remember to do what Mother told me to do. When Saburo got home and showed his parents the smelly cat, his father said to him, Oh, Saburo, don't be so silly. The next time you find something like this, you must wash it in the river. I understand, Father. The next day, Saburo dug up a huge tree stump. He thought very hard and remembered what his father had said about the smelly cat. Father said I should wash anything I find in the river. Saburo took the tree stump and threw it with a great splash into the river. Just then, a neighbor was passing by and said, Saburo, you mustn't throw away valuable things like that. That stump would have made great firewood. You should have broken it up into pieces and taken it home. Oh, I understand. Thank you. On the way home, Saburo spotted a teapot and teacup that somebody had left beside the road. Oh, here's something valuable. I must remember what neighbor told me to do. Saburo took his shovel and broke the teapot and teacup into small pieces. He gathered up the pieces and took them home. Look, mother, look what I found and brought home. Oh my. That was a brand new teapot and teacup that I have given to your father to take with his lunch today. And now you've completely ruined them. The next day, Saburo's parents spoke to him. Saburo, you do everything incorrectly. Mother and I will go work in the fields today. You stay home and take care of the house. They left Saburo home alone. As he said, Saburo thought about what had happened. I really don't understand why people call me silly Saburo. I do exactly what people tell me to do. The end. <laughs> Lingua dancing is a style of Indian dance that is most often seen in Indian films. It is a fusion of different types of classical and folk dances from various parts of India. Now we will enjoy a Bollywood dance performed by me, Kate, Georgia, Isha, Eva, Ani, Jumaila, Anika, Laura, and Elsie.
Thank you for listening to our program today. We hope you have learned something new and that it will teach, lead you to ask questions, have conversations, and be more curious about the rich culture and heritage of Asian Americans. Thank you.